Man, it's so good to be with you all today. My name's Austin. I uh, primarily get the privilege of serving out at our Redwood campus, but I uh, get the honor of opening up God's Word with you all here tonight. Uh, if you were here last week, you would know that Pastor Mark opened up a new series called Sent, which is a series that is going to take us through the entire book of Acts. And last week, Mark laid a great foundation. He told us that, that Luke is the author of this book, Acts. He told us that Luke was writing to a guy by the name of Theophilus, and that the book of Acts is actually the sequel to the Gospel of of Luke. Uh, he did a real great job of just giving us an overview and really just laying a foundation on which that we're going to really build this entire series on. And so if you uh, weren't here last week or if this is your first time jo joining us for worship service, welcome. Uh, but I would, I, would, I would strongly recommend getting your eyes and ears on that uh, ser uh, sermon as soon as possible. And so here's what I'm going to do today. I'm really excited. I'm really excited what we get to talk about today. We are going to talk about one of the most important yet oftentimes most overlooked scenes in the life of Jesus. I, I don't know about you, but when I think of Jesus Christ's highlight reel, my brain goes three places. It goes to the birth of Jesus, right? It goes to Christmas time. I think of the angel, I think of the star, I think of the wise man, I think of Mary, I think of a donkey, and of course, I think of baby Jesus. And then my brain goes to the second place, which is Good Friday, which is the day that we recognize as the day that Jesus marched up this hill, Golgotha, and was crucified for the sins of the world. And then the third place my brain goes is what we call Easter, the resurrection day. And that is the day that, of course, Jesus rose victoriously from the dead, claiming victory over death, proving to the entire world that he is indeed the Savior. That's where my brain goes. But unfortunately, for some reason, I tend to forget one very important event that takes place here in the beginning of the book of Acts. In fact, this event is just as important, if not more important, than these three prior events. And, of course, this event is the ascension of Jesus Christ. In fact, the ascension of Jesus is so important that pastor, author, and speaker, and really the C.S. Lewis of this generation, Tim Keller, says that without the ascension, the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are of no use. For the ascension is the detonator for everything that Christ did and will continue to do on earth. So for our time today, we're going to talk about this monumental event. I'm going to give you three reasons as to why the ascension of Jesus Christ is so important. So that's the goal. That's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we really get into the text and before we start really um, digging in, uh, if you would, just please bow your heads with me one more time and let's pray and just ask the Lord to be with us here tonight. Father, thank you so much for this church. Thank you for Carrie and Michael and, and the worship that we were just led in. Lord, I ask that in, in this text today, God, the text about the ascension. Father, I pray that you would teach us some amazing truths about who you are. And Father, I pray that we would walk out of here with a, with a greater sense of your goodness, your love, your grace, your compassion, and your unbelievable mercy that you have for sinners like me. God, we love you so much. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It will be up on the screen for you to follow along, or you can uh, follow along in your Bible. This is the word of God, verse eight. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Verse nine. And after he, Jesus, had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. Okay, this leads us to our first point. Here's the first reason as to why the ascension of Jesus is so important. And it is because the ascension brought us power. Now this idea of Power is something um, that, that kind of is different for everybody in this culture. For some of you, you think of power as somebody who is physically powerful, like really strong. Maybe you think of Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who has you know, biceps the size of watermelons. Or maybe for some of you older folks, you think of uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Terminator. I don't know, he's a little bit older for me, but some of you guys might like him. Is that bad to say? Oh my, if I offended you, I'm sorry. All right, moving on. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, if you don't think a powerful person is based on their physical strength, maybe you think a powerful person is like a Mark Cuban or like a Kevin O'Leary, right, Shark Tank? And these guys who started at the bottom of the business world but have just clawed their way to the top and now are like gazillionaires running these amazing businesses and have so much influence over everything, maybe that's what you think of as powerful. Maybe for some of you millennials, you might think a powerful person is like somebody who has 100 million Instagram followers, <laughs> 
And that influence they have gives them power and credentials or whatever it may be. Yeah, what we see in scripture is that power is not based off of somebody's um, physical strength or their business prowess or their social media presence, but instead that true power is found in the person of Jesus and in the work of the Holy Spirit. That's where true power is found. In fact, Jesus talks about the kind of power that you and I have as Christians today in a conversation that he had about John the Baptist in Matthew 11. This is what he says. He says, there's never been a greater man who has ever lived than John the Baptist. That right there is a compliment. All right, if I'm John the Baptist, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Jesus just said, I'm the greatest man that's ever walked the place, the, the, the planet Earth. I'm better than David and Abraham and Noah, and I'm just feeling really good about myself. But then Jesus says this. It's crazy what he says. He says, yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. This is crazy, guys. This is unbelievable what Jesus is saying here. Even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than Jesus is? This is, this is insane. So here's what we're gonna do. Statistically speaking, in this room, there is the least person in the kingdom of heaven. Just statistically speaking, there's one of you who would get a participation trophy rather than a first place trophy in your spiritual walk, <laughs> all right? And if you, in your mind, just thought, oh, I would not get the last place trophy, it is you because you have pride in your heart, and Jesus said the last shall be first and the first shall be last. So, <laughs> boom, gotcha. Uh, it's just, it's biblical. But, but, but here's the point that Jesus is making. He is saying that the people of God today, the people in the kingdom of heaven, have more access to the power of God than any generation has ever had before. Ever had before. And guys, the way we have access to this power is because of what Jesus Christ did for you and me on the cross, ushering in the Holy Spirit. You know, I think a lot of time when we think of Good Friday or we think of the death of Jesus, we just simply think of it that way. It's just, oh, it's a story, and we've been taught it for a while. But I want to use a story to illustrate the magnitude of what Jesus did on the cross. I want to use a story. There's a city in Wales, and it's called Bedgalert. And this uh, word Bedgalert literally means Galert's grave. And the story goes that there was a king in this city many years back whose wife had just given birth to their first baby boy. And this king naturally was filled with love and excitement over the birth of his baby. The story goes that the king now had three loves in his life, his wife, his baby, and his loving dog, Galert. And one day, man's best friend, right? One day, the king decided to go hunting and to leave his dog behind in uh, the chambers where the baby was staying. And when the king returned back to his baby's chambers, to his horror, his baby's bed was covered in blood and it was all strewn throughout the room. The king thought to himself, who could have done this? Who would have killed my only baby? At that moment, when he thought that, his faithful, loving companion, Dog Galert, appeared from behind the bed, and his mouth was covered in blood. When the king saw his dog's mouth all bloody and his body all weary, he naturally thought that his dog, Galert, had killed his baby. So the king, without hesitation, in a fit of rage, took out his dagger and he stabbed his dog. And right after he did this, his heart dropped because in the corner of the room lay a dead wolf. And the king realized that the dog Galert didn't kill the baby, but instead was protecting the baby from the wolf. And the blood on the dog's face was not the baby's blood, but it was the wolf's blood. And now the, the baby was completely safe, laying there, completely safe because of the dogs protecting it from the wolf. This is a sad story. This is not a, a fun story that you read to a child at bedtime. But guys, this is the story of the Bible. This is the story of Jesus. We are that baby. We are the ones helpless. Yet Jesus, in his infinite grace, did all that he could to protect us from the wrath and the wickedness of sin. And he laid his life down for you and me so that we can be safe. That's what our Jesus did for us, and that is what had to take place for, in order for the Holy Spirit's power to be ushered into this world. It's a complete result of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. The Holy Spirit is completely, is completely a result of what Jesus did for you and what he did for me. And so when we think of the ascension, we must realize that the ascension is the final act that proved to all of mankind that the power of God was now accessible to the people of God through the Holy Spirit. 
That's one thing the ascension shows us. And so, guys, this is the first reason as to why the ascension is so important. It's so important because it brought us the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to number two. The ascension gives believers hope. This is the second reason as to why the ascension is so important. It's because it gives believers hope. Read with me verse 10. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. You know, if there's one thing that I've learned in this particular season of my life, it is that life can be very hard. And it can sometimes even feel perhaps a little bit hopeless. Uh, really, the reality of how expensive life has recently started kicking in for me. Um, as some of you know, I'm engaged to Maddie. Maddie, lift your hand up. Lift it up. That's her. Yeah, higher, baby. A little bit higher. Uh, yeah, she's marrying me. <laughs> pretty, pretty cool. Um, she didn't know I was going to do that, so she's turning red right now. I can see it. Got that ring on there, though, so I'm good. Um, uh, uh, and the reality of just how expensive it's going to be for, for me to move out of my parents' house, where I don't pay rent, thank you, Lord, and uh, move in with Maddie, uh, it has started kind of setting in for me. And really, the moment it started setting in as to how expensive it's going to be was when we signed the lease over for the place that we're going to be living, and the landlord handed us the keys. And Maddie and I just kind of both looked at each other, and we realized, this is empty, Like, there's no furniture. We don't have a washer and dryer. Like, we don't have anything. And of course, in my brain, I'm going, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. This is money going out of my bank account. So what do we do? We we get in the car, and we um, go over to Medford, and we start looking for furniture. And if you haven't been furniture shopping recently, it's expensive. All right? Like, crazy expensive. But fortunately, Maddie and I find a a love seat and a couch that we like. And so we buy it. We didn't pay for shipping, because that was an extra 150 bucks. And and, uh, and so we we get our furniture, and we're feeling good about it. And then we go to um, Craigslist, and we find um, a a nice table with four chairs and feeling good. Budget, right? And then we get a TV stand, and I'm feeling really good about it. But then I make a huge mistake. I took Maddie to Home Goods in Medford. I took Maddie to Home Goods in Medford. Some of you men are like, rookie mistake. (laughs) You never do that. I did it. I regret it now. Um, But really, when I walk into Home Goods, I don't know if you guys know what Pinterest is, but it's like Pinterest throws up on you. Like right when you walk in, it's like just getting slapped in the face with just Pinterest. And, 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 and Maddie's eyes get all big. And I knew I was in trouble because we're holding hands walking in, being a you know, cute, engaged couple. And then she stops. She gets right in, you know, Pinterest puking all over. She stops. She goes, I'm going to need a cart. And she goes and she grabs a cart. And I'm like, I'm like, are you kidding? Because when Maddie grabs a cart, I hide my wallet because I'm about to get drained. And so, so we're walking through the aisles, and she sees, like, these geometric figurines that are, like, $13, and she's throwing it in the cart, and she's like, you like this? I'm like, babe, what does it do? She's like, it doesn't, no. And she buys, like, these salt things that light up, and I guess it's cool. Um, and so I just keep my mouth shut, though, because I, I know the old saying, it's happy wife, happy life, right? Now, I figure happy fiance, happy future. So I just do it, right? I just, I I don't ask questions. I just, I just, yes, sweetheart, I like it. The salt looks great. It's wonderful. (laughs) Now, believe it or not, I have a reason. I have a reason I'm telling you all of this. Uh, I'm I'm telling you all this because as much as it hurts me to spend money on trinkets and geometric shapes for the house and things of salt that light up, the reason I spend that money and the reason I joyfully spend that money is because I have a hope for the future with Maddie. Right? It's because I have a hope for the future with Maddie. I'll tell you right now, if I didn't love Maddie, there's no way I'm taking her to a furniture store. No way I'm taking her to Home Goods. No chance I'm doing that. Why? Well, because I wouldn't be focused on the future. You see, guys, my hope is set on the eventual day where I can move in with Maddie and be her husband and partake of all of those things that we're buying now. I have something to look forward to. I have something to really just place my hope in. And you see, guys, the ascension of Jesus gives us as Christians something to look forward to. Amen. It gives us a hope to, be, to, to place in. It reassures us of the fact that our King Jesus is alive. He's reigning on the throne right now. He's not absent. He's present. I love what the angels say. They say, this Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you've watched him go into heaven. We have a hope. 
We have a future. We have something to look forward to because our King Jesus is coming back. And you want to know something interesting about hope? I was thinking about hope this week. I was thinking about hope. When we place our hope on something in the future, it gives us a motivation to be productive in the present. I mean, that might sound kind of wordy. I'll say it again. When we place our hope on something in the future, it gives us a motivation to be productive in the present, right? I mean, the reason that I'm spending the money on furniture and silverware and pillows and TV stands and salt figurines is because I am looking forward to the day that I can spend time with my wife in that environment. I think this is one reason why the angels make kind of a little snarky comment. I kind of like it in verse 11. They say, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? Here's kind of what the angels are saying. If I translate this into Austin language, this is what I picture them saying. They're saying, get to work. King Jesus is coming back. You have something to look forward to. You have something to place your hope in. I love it. But here's the thing. As great as this is, just because we have a hope that Jesus is coming back, does not mean that at times in our life we won't feel hopeless, right? Anybody ever felt hopeless? Yeah, I felt hopeless before. Some of, it, some of us definitely right now may, may feel just currently hopeless. Maybe a spouse of 10, 15 years maybe just served you divorce papers. Maybe that kid that you don't know what you're going to do with <laughs> and you keep getting calls from their teacher at school all the time and you just feel hopeless. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this child of mine. Maybe you feel hopeless in an addiction that is currently just owning you and you don't see any hope, no silver lining in breaking the addiction. But if I can humbly encourage you in anything, it would be in the words of Paul the Apostle who penned these words in a very hopeless situation, in a prison cell. This is what he said in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. He says, I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Do you guys want to know what the answer to hopelessness is? Do you want to know how we can destroy the thoughts of hopelessness in our minds? Write this down. The cure to hopelessness is thankfulness. That's the cure to hopelessness. When you feel thankful, the answer is thankfulness. That's the answer. I love what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. You know, one of my all-time favorite stories of someone remaining thankful in the midst of a hopeless situation is a story about Corey Ten Boom. Some of you guys might know who Corey Ten Boom is. Uh, she was a Christian who was alive during Hitler's reign in the events of World War II. Uh, her family was actually hiding a bunch of Jews from Hitler when uh, they got sold out and actually taken into German custody and were uh, transferred to some concentration camps. One camp that uh, Corey and her older sister Betsy were transferred to was the worst prison camp in all of Germany. It was called Ravensbrück. And when Corey got there, she was disgusted with the barracks she was going to live in. She writes later that they were severely overcrowded, and there was no place to go to the bathroom, and so people would just go in the middle of the rows and just wherever because there was nowhere to go. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was that everywhere you looked, the ground, the ceiling was covered in fleas. And above all of that, the Germans had a strict no reading the Bible rule in all of their camps. But by God's grace, Corey was able to smuggle in her only Bible for her and her sister. And the story goes that one morning, uh, when Corey and Betsy were having a Bible study, they came across 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which says, be thankful in all circumstances. And upon reading this, Betsy told her younger sister, Corey, to be thankful for their current living situation. And Corey promptly responded, how and why would I want to thank God for this hopeless, smelly, gross, flea-infested situation? Betsy said, well, the Bible says we must be thankful in all circumstances. She just insisted. And so Corey um, started thanking God for the smell. She started thanking God for the overcrowdedness. And over time, her and her sister Betsy got in the habit of being thankful for their circumstances. And months and months went by, and Corey eventually learned that the reason the guards were never doing barrack checks and going on searches for Bibles and religious stuff was because of the fleas. It was because of the smell. It was because of the overcrowdedness. You see, guys, the point of this story is that what seemed from the outside as a hopeless situation for Corey was actually a time in her life that she learned what true thankfulness really was. She learned what true thankfulness really was in the midst of this hopeless situation. 
And so for those of us right now who feel hopeless, who feel very hopeless, my encouragement is that when hopelessness comes creeping in, we remind ourselves that we have something to be hopeful for. We have something to be thankful for. And that is the return of our king. It's the return of Jesus. He's coming back. So when hopelessness creeps in, combat that with thankfulness in your relationship with Jesus. That's number two. That's number two. The ascension is important because it gives Christians hope. Let's keep going and let's jump down to verse 12. Verse 12. Then they, the apostles, returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath stage journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Verse 14. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So after Jesus ascended onto the mountain, ascended up the, the, into the sky around the cloud, the 11 apostles go off the Mount of Olives and they go back to the upper room and then Luke does something kind of interesting. He takes time to write down everybody's name and throws in that the, the, there's women there and throws in the, Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. This is like a genealogy to me. I don't really see why it's important. But as I began to study this, I, I think I began to kind of understand why Luke wrote this there and what the importance is. I think that Luke is trying to show us and naming all of these names and showing us that everybody was there. I think Luke is trying to show us that regardless of your gender, regardless of your political bent, regardless of your race, and regardless of your socioeconomic background, the one thing that can cause all people together is King Jesus. That's what brings all people together. And guys, this is number three. The ascension is important because it brings all people together. You know, it's interesting when you look at the people that Jesus picked to be his apostles. He picked a guy by the name of Matthew. Let's look at Matthew for a little bit. What do we know about Matthew? Well, we know that Matthew was a part of the Roman government. We know he worked for the Roman government, right? He was a tax collector. And let me tell you, Jews hated tax collectors. They were despised. They were thrown in the same sentence with, with sentences with drunkards and prostitutes. Nobody liked a tax collector. They were unbelievably dishonest, and they were constantly swindling people out of their money. So that was Matthew. Matthew. And then on the flip side of this, we have a guy by the name of Simon, Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot. The Zealot is like the political party he was a part of, right? Or the group or the club he was a part of. And this dude was straight wild. I'm just going to be real. Straight wild, Simon. The historian Josephus says that the Zealots, the group that Simon was a part of, that they were crazed with hatred for Romans, crazed with hatred for Romans. The best way I can think of describing a Zealot is like a member of the Ku Klux Klan, they were motivated by hatred and rage and would do whatever it took to bring down Rome. So follow me here. So we have Matthew, who worked for the Roman government, and then we had Simon, who was hell-bent on bringing down the Roman government. I bet that made for some interesting fireside chats. <laughs> you think your political talk around the cooler at work is, you know, intense. You, I bet this was even more intense, all right? And then we have a guy by the name of John, the Apostle John. And what we know about John is that perhaps he was a wealthy apostle. We see in Mark 1.20 that his father had many hired servants. So he's, you know, picture upper class. And then we have Peter, who was from a poor, lower class fishing family. And then you throw in the women who were undervalued and overlooked in this culture. And we see just quite the melting pot in the mix of different types of people in the upper room. Here's my point. The one thing that will unify conservatives and liberals, the one thing that will unify whites and blacks, and the one thing that will unify the upper class and the lower class is our King Jesus. That's the one person who has brought everybody together, regardless of where they come from financially, regardless of what their skin color is, regardless of their nationality. Everybody will come on, at one day, and the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that day is coming. That day is coming. You guys, my hope is that when we think of the ascension of Jesus Christ, we would be reminded of the call that we have as Christians to tell the world that Jesus is coming back, that he's coming back, he's, he's, he's alive, he's not dead, and that we could tell the world that even though Fox and CNN and MSNBC report on the hopelessness of mankind, my hope is that Christians would respond by saying, say, saying hey, listen, we have something to look forward to. We have something to place our hope in. It's the descending king, Jesus, who's coming back. 
And I hope that when we think of the ascension, that would motivate us to tell the rich, to tell the poor, to tell the whites, to tell the blacks, to tell the Asians, to to, to tell everybody that we have a hope, that we have a king, that we have a savior, Jesus Christ. And guys, this is the point of our entire series. This is the point of being sent. It has everything to do with us as a church going in all the world, proclaiming and telling the world about the goodness of our Savior, of our King, Jesus. The ascension is a beautiful, beautiful story that shows us that the power of God is now in the people of God. It shows us that we have a hope and that hopelessness can be extinguished. And lastly, it shows us that if we want unity, it won't come through a politician, it won't come through a businessman, it won't come through a social media star, it will come through our King, Jesus. That's it. That's it. And so as we continue in this series, just keep that in mind. Just keep that in mind that we have a mission, we have a plan. And that is to tell everybody about the love and the grace and the mercy of our King and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Pray with me. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the band. Thank you for Michael and Carrie. And Father, I just ask that um, this message, this story of the ascension would motivate us as Christians God, I pray that it would drive us to the cross. I pray that it would encourage us to be more like you. Father, I pray that when hopelessness starts creeping into our brains, we would respond with an overwhelming sense of your reality, of that you're our king, our savior. Father, help us to live our lives for you. Let us be sent in our everyday lives. Help us to minister to every person regardless of their race, gender. Father, we love you so much. Thank you that you love us. I pray all these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.